What's going on, everyone? I'm just a typical average American here today to react and learn about Canada's unusual border with Denmark. Uh, unusual to say the least. Canada, Denmark, they're not, they're not bordering. It doesn't, it doesn't, something doesn't add up here. It doesn't make sense. This video really caught my attention because it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> How Canada just got a land border with Denmark. When was this made? Uh, this was July 14th, July, August, September, October, three months ago. Uh, Canada apparently is bordering Denmark. I don't understand how that is a thing, <laughs> but that's the point. <laughs> when you don't understand something, you look it up on YouTube and you watch it, as I always say. So <laughs> with that being said, let's check it out. Last month, the world's geography just changed forever. Canada and Denmark are two totally different nations located thousands of miles apart from one another on different continents separated by the entire Atlantic Ocean. But yeah. in one significant way, the two nations share one major geographic similarity. Until what? just last month in June of 2022, they were two of only 17 countries across the world that shared a land border with just a single other country. The other Oh, really? Uh, that's an, that's a fun fact. That is a fun fact if ever I heard, and I had fun listening to it. Canada only borders the United States. What does Denmark border? France or something? Others being Brunei's single border with Malaysia, the Dominican Republic and Haiti each bordering the other on the island of Hispaniola, the Gambia that's surrounded by Senegal, the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom each bordering the other on the island of Ireland, Monaco mm. surrounded by France, Vatican City and San Marino each surrounded by Italy, Lesotho surrounded by South Africa, Papua New Guinea stuck with Indonesia on one island and Timor-Leste stuck with them on another island, Portugal stuck on the Iberian Peninsula with Spain, Qatar stranded on a peninsula blocked by Saudi Arabia, and South Korea stuck on another peninsula blocked in by North Korea. Wow. Until last month, Denmark's only land border was with Germany to their immediate south. Germany. Dang it. Germany. I should have known that one. <laughs> you know, it's kind of nice, uh, Canada and the United States being part of that exclusive little club. Although, we're not anymore because of Denmark. Hey, <laughs> that was beautiful for a moment there. Come on. We had a thing going, it was just the two of us. While Canada's only land borders were with the United States across the south and the west with Alaska. But despite being located thousands of miles away on two different continents, Canada and Denmark are a lot closer than you probably initially thought. What, it, what does that mean? What does that even mean? Because as of the 11th of June, 2022, they each officially border each other by land. And that means that they've each removed themselves from the already small list of countries that only border a single other country. What? Is, what you can't... Canada, Canada, stop it. You're, you're drunk. Go home. You can't just decide to border Denmark like that. I won't... I, no. We border each other by land. And border each other by land? Huh. Is this like some kind of temporal space-time rift we're talking about? Has space bending technology allowed this? I don't see ha any other way. That only border a single other country. But how can a country in Europe and another in North America even border each other by land? Mm. Well, it's because their border is a very tiny one and it's located right here in the literal middle of nowhere on a small, barren, uninhabited rock of an island known as Hans Island. What? What? <laughs> Hans Island. I gotta zoom back out. I gotta see the zoom in again. I don't even know where we're talking about anymore. Very north. Another in North America even border each other by land. Well, it's because their border is a very tiny one and it's located right here in the literal middle- What? Isn't that, uh, Greenland up there? Or... And then, is this technically part of, part of Canada on the left? It is. Oh my goodness, the most north- of Canada you can possibly even think about getting. You're almost traveling around the earth at that point. <laughs> okay, okay, Hans Island. Hans Island. 
Today, Denmark and Canada both split the island roughly 60-40 respectively across a border that's only a tad longer than 1,200 meters. What? <laughs> Why? How? Why? Somehow Canada and Denmark ended up splitting a random island in the middle of nowhere. Okay, that's... That's why, that's why, okay. This is what makes them both technically bordering nations now. But for yeah. decades before just last month, the issue of who between them actually owned this insignificant and pointless island was an unresolved territorial dispute that generated one of modern history's friendliest, good-natured, and wackiest conflicts. No look at this little, look at this little island causing all this, causing this rift that has removed America and Canada from an exclusive list together. I just want to go stand on that little island in the center, right? And be in half in Denmark and half in Canada and pout there, right on that border, and then go home. Known as the Whiskey War, it was a very rare territorial dispute for both nations, and particularly for Canada, who also shares the longest international border in the world with the United States further to the south and the west, yes. stretching for nearly 9,000 kilometers in length. From a more European perspective, that is a length of border equivalent to the distance between Portugal and Bangladesh. Wow. But despite this massive length, the border between the United States and Canada has been generally calm and peaceful for most of the past two centuries, with yep. few disagreements. The only notable disagreement that they have over land today is the maritime border between the two nations off the coast of the U.S. state of Maine and the Canadian province of New Brunswick. He really? Maritime border? New Brunswick and the U.S.? I'm gonna have to learn more about this. Or maybe he'll tell us a little more about this. Here, the Canadians insist that the maritime border between themselves and the Americans is here. While uh, the Americans, conversely, insist that the maritime border is actually here. Of course, of course. Oh, I wonder how much a difference that is. Huh. It doesn't really matter all that much, save for a couple small islands that are stuck in between the two competing claims here. Machias yeah. Seal Island, home to a single controversial Canadian-built lighthouse and visited often by American tourist boats, and the oh. even smaller and insignificant North Rock. Legally speaking, both the United States and Canada maintain overlapping claims of sovereignty to both of these uninhabited and meaningless islands. Oh wow. <laughs> we both just, both just like, that is ours. That is, that is our lighthouse. And then if, uh, I, I guarantee you, if an American showed up at the lighthouse and a Canadian showed up, everyone would get along. No one's actually that angry over the lighthouse. At least I hope not which means that they sort of just exist in this weird legal gray zone. The final specks of the North American continent north of the Rio Grande that haven't yet been settled. But okay. somehow even less significant and yet more controversial than these little islands is Hans Island which yeah. for nearly half a century existed as a diplomatic thorn in the side of Canadian-Danish relations. How? I understand the Canadian part of this, Hans Island, but how did Denmark <laughs> insert itself into this? With each claiming the entirety of the island for themselves. The conflict dates back to Canada's control over Ellesmere Island and Denmark's control over Greenland and the narrow Nary Strait that flows in between them. Oh, 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 oh. I didn't know Denmark. Denmark controlled Greenland? When? Wow. Apparently a lot of stuff happened before I was born. <laughs> Go figure. For most of history, the exact maritime border between the Canadians and the Danes here was legally undefined and generally assumed to be the strait itself. Mm. Because, well, it's a frozen wasteland where nobody actually lives permanently. Right, right. Why are we... Uh, I was gonna say, why are we people even fighting over this? But, you know, land is land, territory is territory. Nations are going to fight over that just on, uh, you know, principle alone, not really the practical, the practicality of getting to stomp around on your frozen wasteland. That's not the point. Although maybe if you did conquer all of it, you would maybe stomp around on it a little, 
just to prove your point further. The closest actual permanently inhabited settlements are Alert in Canada, 198 kilometers away, and Sorora Paluk in Greenland, 349 kilometers away. And the huh. So some people actually do live up there. Wow. They are collectively home to less than 150 people. This area oh. was simply never really geopolitically important until in the 1970s, when people started figuring out that there could be valuable things like oil and natural gas in the area. Uh... And so in 1972, a team of both Canadians and Danes began working on the first legally defined maritime boundary between each of their big Arctic islands. That's what it is. Once money, money is involved get a little cheddar involved, suddenly everyone cares about splitting the maritime border uh, correctly. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. They established 127 points of latitude and longitude across the Nares Strait, roughly in the center between Ellesmere and Greenland, and then okay. drew a line between all of these points to formally mark out the border. But there mm. was a small anomaly. Around here, the strait is only about 35 kilometers wide. And this speck of rock called Hans Island is pretty much dead in the center of it. <laughs> it's 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 literally just a coincidence. It's just fate. Hans Island just happens to be in the dead center. That's the only reason. Otherwise one otherwise one side could have just said this is clearly ours. Huh. Funny how that kind of stuff uh works out. Which is why both the Canadian and Danish surveying teams each claimed it for their own respective countries. Yeah. Unable to come to any kind of agreement, the 1970s era maritime treaty between them simply left the border in the Nares Strait between points 122 and 123 blank, with Hans Island itself an undefined territory in the middle. They basically mm. just decided to kick the issue of ownership over the island down the road for someone else to figure out at a later time. <laughs> right. I don't blame them. It's like, uh, no one really cared enough. So it was like, why get all worked up over it kind of thing. At some point in the future, maybe in 2022, we'll work this out. <laughs> it's just that nobody at the time probably expected that a later time would mean about half a century and the collective efforts of 26 different foreign ministers. For oh, wow. decades in between then and 2022, Canadian and Danish soldiers took alternating turns visiting the island and raising their own respective flags, taking down the other's <sighs> flag, and placing a bottle of their favorite national liquor. In 1984... <laughs> oh, wow, this has been like a thing. Wow. Sending parties up there to take down the other flag, put up your flag. It's like almost, it's almost silly. It's almost like a game at that point. Where at least I don't think there was any military, like, actual fighting on the ground over this island. It was almost like petty, <laughs> like, tearing down their flag and putting yours up and leaving a bottle <laughs> just to rub it in their face. It's almost like a, a backyard game or something. A group of Canadian soldiers visited by helicopter raised up their flag and left a bottle of Canadian Club whiskey for the Danes who they knew would come by later. And sure oh. enough, the Danes did by respectfully taking down and folding up the Canadian flag, raising the Danish flag, and replacing the Canadian Club whiskey with a bottle of their own Danish schnapps, oh. along with a sign which simply read, Welcome to the Danish Island. It almost sounds like... They're poking fun at each other at that point. Like, it's all a big game and a joke. <laughs> Even though it kind of isn't, because it's kind of important. But, I don't know, it's kind of, kind of wholesome in a way. This humorous process kept going back and forth for decades until it got a bit more contentious and a little less friendly in 2005. Oh. In that year, the Canadian Defence Minister at the time, Bill Graham, decided to set foot on the island personally to raise up the Canadian flag and assert his nation's sovereignty to it. Oh. Just five days after his visit, the Danish government filed an official protest to the Canadian government. While the Danish Deputy Premier of Greenland publicly stated that Hans Island had been occupied by Canada. Tensions were at an all-time high. No, uh, you're just, everyone was having fun for like decades, just having a fun old time, and then it had to go and become all serious. But apparently this got resolved at some point. 
right? And the Danes decided to send over this fearsome warship to the island to reassert Danish control. But then, the okay. prime ministers of both countries began to call for peace and calm. And both the Canadian and Danish foreign ministers agreed to meet thousands of miles away from Hans Island in New York City to discuss the terms of diplomacy. During huh. that meeting, they essentially agreed to solve the matter diplomatically, but they each continued insisting that Hans Island was rightfully theirs in entirety. So, in practice, it didn't really go anywhere. Although the Danish foreign minister did agree that he would cancel his ship's mission to the island. <laughs> Cancel the warship coming. <laughs> My gosh, all this over a little island. But like I said, it's more about the principle of the matter uh, than how tiny the island is. And that he wouldn't take down the Canadian flag and rehoist the Danish flag. At least for a while. Mm. Beginning in 2012, there were renewed calls within both countries to solve the issue by simply splitting the island in half. And yeah. then, six years later from there, in 2018, they each announced a new joint task force to settle the border dispute once and for all, which was finally officially agreed upon another four years later, on the 10th of June, 2022, with roughly 60% of the island going to Denmark by extension of Greenland's own control, and the other 40% going to Canada's none of it territory. And yeah, it's, uh, it's to the point where now Greenland is a thing. And did, was this in the news recently in Canada? I imagine it had to be. This is like a funny kind of nice little show of respect between nations and the resolution of this really, really, really long contest over the island. So this is, this is a very fun little story. I'm glad it didn't turn violent. Uh, very glad. own control, and the other 40% going to Canada's none of it territory. And pretty much the only reason why it took so long to actually solve was that it was actually pretty convenient politically for both nations to continue keeping it unsolved. Canada oh. and Denmark have been allies with one another for a very long time, and have enjoyed friendly relations for decades, going back to them each being founding members of the NATO alliance in 1949. If you pay closer attention to the actual dates when the Canadians and Danes made their highly publicized visits to the island, raising their flags and leaving behind their national liquor, they generally always took place soon before election season in each country. It was an easy method for both governments to just kick up some patriotic feelings and sentiments, right? Oh, oh man, that's interesting. That's such a interesting little subtle detail where they they kind of liked how it was arranged where they could both kick out each other's flag and raise their own and it was almost agreed upon like a little pact that that was okay to stir up like national pride during election season that's funny okay before an election that literally had no risk or downside at all both yeah. Copenhagen and Ottawa had obvious political incentives to keep dragging out the irrelevant conflict for decades. Yeah. Especially once it was discovered that the island didn't have any resources, and any potential oil or gas nearby would probably be too expensive to drill and economically unviable. Hans Island was always politically valuable to keep contested. But then in 2022, it suddenly became politically valuable instead to actually solve it. In oh. February, the Russians shocked much of the world when they decided to settle their border disputes with Ukraine by launching an enormous and bloody invasion with hundreds of thousands of troops, culminating yes. in the biggest war seen on the European continent since the end of World War II that yeah. has already caused tens of thousands of violent deaths and millions of refugees, accompanied by a newfound... Somehow, uh, the war in Ukraine and Russia had to do with deciding to wrap up this little fun, um, Hans Island. Global sense of uncertainty and fear for the future not seen since the end of the first Cold War. What better way for the governments of Canada and Denmark, two NATO allies, to place a spotlight on Russia's own military aggression in Europe by solving their own long-standing territorial dispute over Hans Island peacefully? Okay, it was almost like a, a statement, an opportunity to make a statement, a really nice statement about the strength and unity of these two countries and NATO and stuff like that. Okay, I get it. That's, that's nice. 
The matter is all the more pressing to the Arctic members of NATO, like Canada and Denmark, along with the United States, Iceland, and Norway. Because in recent years, the Russians have been rapidly remilitarizing their region of the Arctic with airfields, radar stations, highly increased troop deployments, and even the presence of nuclear missiles and torpedoes. You know, it's kind of cool seeing the globe from this point of view. I'm, I'm a little distracted seeing the Earth from the top like this gives you such a better idea of how close everything is to each other when you get on the, the top of the Earth, the north side of the Earth, if that makes sense. It's actually really interesting to look at. As the Arctic continues to warm throughout this century, it will become one of the greatest arenas of conflict in the new 21st century Cold War between NATO on the one side and the Russians and Chinese over on the other. And looking hmm. forward into this inevitable future, keeping an unresolved territorial dispute open between two NATO allies within the Arctic, no matter how friendly and cordial, would have been an unwise decision geopolitically. Wait, really? Is that really part of the thought process of this? That's kind of somber, solemn, literally uh, a factor of ending this pretend dispute over the island was to tie up any loose ends in in regards to like prospects of future conflict and war um i mean maybe that's a good thought to have if you have to if you're forced to think about that maybe that is a good thought but it is a little sad and so, the time had finally come for Denmark and Canada to solve it once and for all, and formally become neighbors by land as well as by sea. After all, right. a lot of what's happening today are the consequences of what happened yesterday, last year, and even last century and beyond. Keeping up with current events is essential to your ability to understand the way our world works. And I get to do that every single day by reading all of the new short articles posted to Morning Brew. Okay, I <laughs> I could tell he was going segueing into an ad. All right, I think that's the end of the video. Yeah, it is. Okay, this was by Real Life Lore. I gotta give that a like. That was so well done, so interesting, well presented. As a Canadian, I'm almost disappointed that our adorable little rivalry with Denmark is over. Ah, oh, sad face. Yeah, it is kind of sad. Um, as a Dane, I'm pleased to now be sharing a land border with such a friendly country as Canada. Oh, how nice. Hello there to our new Canadian neighbors from Denmark. Very nice. Very nice. I'm glad the Whiskey War has finally ended. Is that what it, you could call it? The Whiskey War. That's kind of funny. <laughs> uh, this is a historically significant... This is a historically significant since the Vikings were fir the first Europeans who arrived in the New World and the first to arrive in modern-day Canada. Okay. I'm Canadian. I find it really funny how it took us 50 years to resolve a border dispute over a useless rock. And now I'm glad we share a border with two countries. You know what? Fine. If you're so happy about it, fine. We'll we'll accept it. You know, we liked being the your one and only border buddy, the Americans. But, you know, Denmark is cool, too. You can come in. It's fine. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, in all seriousness, this was a very interesting story. Never heard of this. Never knew about Hans Island. Never knew about this fun little dispute. Pretend dispute. Fun little story. I enjoyed this. And now it's over. But I'm glad I got to learn about it. Anyway, if you're glad you got to learn about it with me as well, feel free to give this video a like or leave a comment. And if you're interested in more videos like this, me reacting to Canada, Canadian culture, things going on in Canada, that I've never seen before, feel free to subscribe for more. And until then, thanks for watching, and see you next time.